I just want to say good evening to everyone. Um, like Mayor Jones said, I am Shanika Thomas, and I am the chair of the Wake County Board of Commissioners. And I would like to welcome you all today to today's Criminal Justice Town Hall. My colleagues, Commissioner Don Mile and Commissioner Cheryl Stallings, over here in the corner, are with me here tonight. Um, and we are really excited. This is the fourth town hall for a Better Wake's blueprint to dismantle systemic racism. And it's a crucial topic for us to discuss for our community. And I appreciate the time that you all have taken to come here today, tonight, and learn from one another and to share your own expertise. If we wanna break down racism that's been enshrined in our institutions for hundreds of years, it's gonna take a lot of work. And more importantly, it's gonna take a lot of partners. As a commissioner, it's often my role to bring people together to initiate and to strengthen collaboration so that we can make Wake County a better place for everyone. And as wonderful as it would be if our county government had a magic wand and we could knock out our goals and meet constituent needs with just a magic wand, it's not that easy. It takes a lot of work to move the needle and it takes a lot of work with partners. At a high level, our role in the county is to create and fund policies and programs that improve our residents' lives. And on the ground level, that means we're in the thick of budget season right now. And anyone who's looked at our budget book, it's about three inches thick, would correctly guess that it's not the funnest, at least not my funnest part of my job. Right? I, I appreciate opportunities like this more. But it's essential, really, that the seven commissioners come together and make decisions about our priorities and our resources so that Wake County can do thousands of things, like funding schools and recruiting and training emergency workers and creating new parks and supporting economic development. Our work and the work of Team Wake's 4,500 employees touches our community daily in countless ways, from health clinics to affordable housing. And so that means that the work for people who experience systemic discrimination based on race happens every single day. And as current leaders, we know that we didn't build these systems that disadvantage people because of their skin tone. Many of those people look like me, but we did inherit those systems, systems that hurt people based on race all the same. That means that now it's our job it's our responsibility to work hard for racial equity. It's our job to break down and reinvent the parts of our society that have hurt people for too long. And sometimes that means being creative and charting a new course. But trailblazing can be scary, y'all, when we talk about the darkest parts of our past and our present, when we discuss the realities of bias suffering that some people refuse to recognize and other people violently defend. But plotting a new course is a lot easier with a partner. As a matter of fact, it's better with a whole team. I'll give you an example. Last summer, Judge Ashley Parker Dunstan shared with me an idea that she had for how people could get support to help navigate the legal system. And her vision really spoke to a worry that had weighed on my heart since I'd learned that there were a lot of families in our community who couldn't afford the legal advice to navigate the high stakes of an often confusing legal system. And with her work and the work of dozens of other leaders, the District Court, Legal Aid of North Carolina, Campbell University School of Law, my fellow commissioners, we were able to create something totally new for Wake County. In January, we cut the ribbon on Wake County's first legal support center, where families can learn about how the courts work and get assistance on paperwork and legal referrals. The center is open to every person interfacing with the courts in Wake County, regardless of what municipality you live in. And it's a tool towards adjusting and addressing racial disparities in our criminal justice system. This is a system with a grim history of using complicated procedures, confusing documents, and high fees to take advantage of black and brown people. So providing access to information for all chips away at that old system. So this important new program started a conversation. I mean, I guess it kind of started with a lot of conversations. Conversations between people with different perspectives and different abilities, but it was a common goal of improving life for people in Wake County. And I hope that in the future, we'll be able to look back on this conversation, the one that we're having tonight, as one that, many got, that got many of us moving toward racial equity in our criminal justice system here in Wake County. Our Board of Commissioners in Wake County, and I'm sure the Board of Commissioners here in the town of Wake Forest and all of our municipalities is committed to racial equity, including in our legal systems. So I'm glad that we are here tonight, shoulder to shoulder, having this conversation. Thank you again and welcome. Systemic racism is not something that only emerges at singular moments in time. It is woven into the fabric of our society 
and it weighs constantly on the human experience. So we cannot expect to dismantle systemic racism through a singular moment, but rather through a movement. And that's what we need to create, a movement for a better wake. A better wake is a charge to our community to commit to dismantling systemic racism, and it started with a diverse collection of local leaders committed to address racism and overhaul any systems that negatively impact black and brown residents. With this leadership and your commitment, we can turn this moment into a movement. Join our collective commitment. 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 To dismantle systemic racism in our community. Please visit abetterweek.com to make your commitment today. Good afternoon. How are y'all doing? I remember this statement. Where were you when? Oftentimes when you hear that, what was the reference point for you? Anybody? Where were you when you fill in the blank? The assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you. Anybody else? Hey. Assassination of John Kennedy. Yes, absolutely, John and Robert Kennedy. Anybody else? You said 9-11? 9-11, absolutely. Where were you when? The Challenger explosion. Absolutely, I remember I was in elementary school, Oaks Road, New Bern. How about where were you when you heard about the murder of Breonna Taylor, and that name had been tagged along to Ahmaud Arbery, and then it was a dotted line to the murder of George Floyd. And I think collectively our community and those three names really got us uh, thinking about what can we do and some of the challenges in acknowledging that there's a different lived reality for our black, black, black and brown residents and what can we do to ensure that we dismantle any system that create the type of disparities that we had seen eons before. But for some reason, and I have to, you have to, this is a rhetorical question, what changed? Why did these three names create such a, this, this movement and this energy to say that we need to start having honest, courageous conversations and move this work forward? And I think that's a question that you should have within your circles, within your community, uh, as we move this work forward, but regardless of the why, uh, we're here. And our community came together, literally, we had leaders from the Raleigh Chamber, uh, from Wake County Economic Development, the city of Raleigh, Wake County, uh, and, 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 and companies all coming together asking the same question, what can we do? Uh, those that may have not been in the fight towards race equity, but folks that wanted to build their fluency in the space, there was this there was this energy around just trying to figure out what part can I play? And so when these community members got together that summer of 2020, uh, we decided to launch this initiative called A Better Wake. And A Better Wake was really about how can we build the fluency and really operationalize systemic racism? How can we give words and terminology and, and talk about how do we galvanize all of these different efforts, all of these different energies towards doing something, what can we do so that everybody can get on the same page? So we launched a website, abetterwake.com, and it, and it asked for individuals as members of the community to sign up uh, to advocate for this work, and it also asked for organizations uh, to also sign up as well to show their, their support. We were able to provide uh, a list of resources for you to do your own individual uh, learning and your walk towards this work, but we also added an action guide. An action guide for you to, again, take this work and really start to integrate it into your sphere of influence. And to be honest with you, our commitment, if you don't mind if it's okay for me to share, this was the commitment statement that we wordsmithed that summer. 
And if you can imagine, you know, over 30 people coming together with different ideologies, with different perspectives about the problem, we spent weeks coming up with this statement that we acknowledge that there's a high quality of life in the region for many, but for those who have been historically underserved, underrepresented and marginalized, there is a different reality altogether. That reality is rooted in systemic racism. It has permeated the justice system, created monumental education, health and wealth disparities between black and brown residents and white Americans and resulted in discriminatory practices. This moment is the culmination of such injustice. Now, how many of you all also saw statements that other organizations were making as well? Yeah, we were no different. But we wanted to ensure that our statement wasn't just that. We wanted to take this momentum, we wanted to take this energy, we wanted to take this statement and put it into action. And so what we did, we solicited um, pulling together a third party evaluator, a third party assessor, if you will, uh, RTI International to come work with us on creating a blueprint. Uh, and when we first initiated, we, we called it a 10 year blueprint to dismantle systemic racism. Could it provide us a true north of the work that we needed to do around some of the, the four major areas, one being criminal justice that we're talking about today, but also education, economic mobility, and also health. And so the blueprint became our true north. And that became our opportunity to look at those recommendations that came out and to go from just being a moment, right? Just one statement and moving into strategy. And so we're really excited that you all are being a part of this conversation as we advance this work. Um, I, I tell my, my colleagues all the time that this is a marathon work. Uh, and hopefully what we can do, some of you in the room can not only engage in providing us uh, support, some recommendations around solutions, but also what is this going to look like when we pass the torch? So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Crystal Carmichael to talk a little bit, go a little bit deeper into the work and why we're here today. All right. Thank you, Mr. Perry. So good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. Um, to discuss this very important matter about um, criminal justice and equity in our criminal justice system. It's now time to address, confront the deep-rooted issues that have led to disparities and how our justice system treats individuals based on race, socioeconomic status, and some other factors. We can't deny the painful truth that our current system disproportionately impacts communities of color and perpetuates cycles of inequality. We see the statistics that reveal a higher likelihood of arrest, harsher sentences, and over-representation of marginalized populations in our prisons and in our jails. The Southern Coalition for Social Justice found that black students in Wake County were 7.3 times more likely than white students to receive suspension. The ability to be successful in school can be difficult for children who miss class due to suspensions. Suspensions are key in the school to prison pipeline as they punish students instead of providing age appropriate supports, they stigmatize young people as being troublesome and they often result in unsupervised time during school hours. Black students in Wake County make up more than half of school suspensions, despite representing only 22% of the school age population. Black and Hispanic students combined account for three quarters of school suspensions. From 2018 to 2020, black people made up 49% of warrantless misdemeanor arrests, 49% of traffic stops, and 57% of traffic stops resulting in arrests in Wake County, despite making up only 20% of the total population. But let us not dwell on the problem. We're here tonight to focus on the solutions. We have a very unique opportunity. It is within our power right now to reimagine the criminal justice system, one that upholds principles of equity and of justice. There is an urgency for change and the time for equity is now.
So one area we must address are the biases and prejudices that exist within our system. We have to acknowledge that systemic racism does exist, and it plays a role in decisions made at every level of the justice system. Another area we have to prioritize is rehabilitation and restorative justice over punishment alone. Our goal should not solely be punitive, but also focused on transforming lives and reintegrating individuals into society. By investing in education, vocational training, mental health services, and addiction treatment, we can break the cycle of recidivism and provide opportunities for individuals to rebuild their lives. We can absolutely do this by modeling transparency and accountability at all levels. And lastly, we must engage in community collaboration. We have to foster dialogue between the criminal justice system and the communities we serve. By building trust, promoting mutual understanding, and involving community members in the decision-making process, we can create a system that better reflects the needs of our community. As I close, achieving equity in our criminal justice system requires collective action and commitment to change. One of my favorite quotes is one by Lily Tomlin, and she says, I always wondered why somebody didn't do something about that. And then I realized I was somebody. If you know you're somebody, can, can you raise your hand real quick? A little bit higher? Okay, I want y'all to keep that same energy. Keep that same energy like the young folks say. But I really want us to stand together, shoulder to shoulder, to advocate for a system that treats everybody equitably and justly, regardless of their background. By doing this, we can move toward a society where justice is truly blind, and all individuals are given a genuine opportunity to rebuild their lives. Thank you. Hello, everyone. All right, we are about to get to the, 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 the meat and potatoes of why you all are here. But first, um, you, you heard before, this is our fourth town hall, and this has really been a community engaging event. Um, at our first town hall, the Health Equity Town Hall, we had a bunch of health professionals in the room. Um, at our second, we had a, a bunch of people who work in economic mobility. Um, our third, we had a lot of educators deep in the room, and so I'm gonna ask, uh, if you work um, in, in, in law enforcement, in the criminal justice system, if you work in corrections or the court system, if you could please stand so we could acknowledge you being here and working with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Because it is a community effort. It takes all of us to come together and have these courageous conversations. So thank you so much for being here. I'm Dr. Tori Staten. I'm the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusivity at the Raleigh Chamber. And thank you all again for being here and engaging with us. I'm here to introduce our amazing panelists for this evening. Panelists, once I say your name, if you could please stand um, and join us at the panel table. If you are the moderator, you can join me up here and uh, we will get started first. Lauren Freeman, if you could please stand. Everybody give it up for Lauren Freeman was first elected as Wake County District Attorney in 2014. Attorney Freeman is proud to be the first and only woman to serve as Wake County District Attorney. During her time as the Wake County District Attorney, she has created new diversion programs, including a mental health diversion program that prioritizes treatment compliance and allows for dismissal of the underlying charge if they maintain compliance. She led effort to help those who exit the criminal justice system re-enter our community successfully. Look at them hard at work. Y'all can hear the, uh, y'all can, can hear them. Led efforts to help those who exit the criminal justice system re-enter our community successfully by connecting them with resources and pro bono attorneys to help them with expungements. She also led an ongoing effort to improve our pretrial release practices. This effort helps ensure that no one is held in jail awaiting trial that doesn't need to be there for public safety reasons. Held public officials accountable as well. Lauren believes government employees, elected officials, and law enforcement officers must be held accountable. She has handled more cases against public officials than any DA in the state. 
Attorney Freeman has prosecuted public officials who have stolen public money, recouping hundreds of thousands of dollars for taxpayers. She also provided implicit bias training for all her staff in 2020 and helped facilitate discussions on race, equity, and inclusion. Prior to becoming district attorney, Lauren was the elected clerk of Superior Court for eight years. Lauren previously worked in the North Carolina Attorney General's office representing the North Carolina Alcoholic Beverages Control Commission the Criminal Justice Education and Training Standards Commission, and the North Carolina State Highway Patrol. Ms. Freeman received her undergraduate and law degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Upon graduating, she served as research assistant to former Chief Justice Burley Mitchell. She then worked as an assistant district attorney in Ray County, everybody, Attorney Lauren Freeman. <laughs> Next, Dr. Ashley Gaddy. Dr. Ashley Gaddy is the founder and head consultant of Ashley Gatter Enterprises. Social justice education, social change, and empowerment efforts are her passions. And she believes everyone has the ability to use them positively. As a black Southern woman working at a predominantly white institution, she spends much of her time advocating for underrepresented students, faculty, and staff learning about the issues they face. Dr. Gaddy is also dedicated to educating and serving the community, working with nonprofit organizations and building partnerships with corporations and government. Her professional background started in the corporate communication system and transitioned into higher education. Her experience in the university began in housing and has branched into other academic areas, including serving in the classroom as an instructor. Dr. Gaddy received her bachelor's in communication studies and master's in liberal studies from the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. And she just received her doctoral degree in 2023 in cultural studies. She loves spending time with family and friends and her dog Bobo while relaxing on the beach. She is also a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Everybody, Dr. Ashley Gaddy Roberts. William Lassiter, MPA. He is the Deputy Secretary for Division of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention with the NC Department of Public Safety. As Deputy Secretary of Juvenile Justice, he oversees juvenile facility operations, juvenile court systems, juvenile community programs, and juvenile intervention and treatment programs. He does a lot. Mr. Lassiter received his master's degree in public administration from North Carolina State University. He has over, he has over 25 years of experience in the juvenile justice system. In 2010, Mr. Lassiter was called upon to serve as the state contracts administrator for juvenile community programs. In 2013, he was promoted to director of juvenile community programs where he worked to, to develop a comprehensive service delivery model for youth in the state's juvenile justice system. In 2015, Mr. Lassiter was appointed to the governor's task force on mental health and substance use for which he co-chaired the work group on children, youth, and families. Governor Rory Cooper appointed Mr. Lassiter as chair of the NC Task Force for Safer Schools in October 2019. This task force serves as an advisory board for the Center for Safer Schools and provides guidance and recommendations to the governor, superintendent of public administration, and the General Assembly to improve statewide, pol statewide policy to enhance statewide and local capacity to create safer schools. Mr. Lassiter was honored to receive the prestigious National Service Award from the Hamilton Fish Institute on School and Community Violence for, ex for his exemplary service to children, youth, and communities. Lassiter has also co-authored Presenting Preventing Violence and Crime in American Schools from Put-Downs to Lockdowns, which takes an in-depth look at the causes and solutions of youth violence. He has been featured on a number of major news networks and national publications, including CNN, Fox News, the BBC, USA Today, the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, and many others. Everybody, Mr. William Lassiter. And finally, uh, Mr. Frank White could not be here today, but we are happy to have Donya Perry to serve on our panel as well. Donya Perry. 
Tanya Perry serves as the first Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusivity with Wake County. In his role, Perry leads Wake County's efforts to advance diversity, build equity, and accelerate inclusion. From creating a clear vision and providing strategic direction, Perry seeks to promote belonging and support, working in environments where all have the opportunity to succeed. Prior to joining Wake County, Perry held two critical leadership positions for the Raleigh Chamber of Commerce. He served as the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusivity, where he led the Triangle DEI Alliance and as Director of Equitable Economic Development. In these roles, he supported efforts to build inclusive prosperity and support our historically underrepresented business and residents. Perry worked for communities and schools of North Carolina for 12 years, most recently serving as Vice President of Youth Development. He's a native of North Carolina, hailing from New Bern, before earning a BA in political science and master's in public administration from the North Carolina State University. He is also a passionate social justice activist, youth advocate, and capitalizes on any opportunity to volunteer and facilitate positive change in the community. Perry loves music, laughs, and seeks every opportunity to work across difference. He lives by the acronym coined by a former mentee, PEACE, that is proper education always causes elevation. Everyone, I'm excited to present to you all your panel tonight. All right, I'm gonna come down and join the panel down here. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, they didn't add it to Danya's bio that uh, he started his career with me um, and that, uh, at the Center for the Prevention of School Violence and we co-authored that book together. Um, and so um, great panel that we've got here, work with all these individuals, even work with uh, uh, Dennis, the, the, the father. Um, and so we're really excited to have the panel tonight and um, get their input on race equity in the criminal justice system. And so the first question I'll start um, out with the panel tonight is, can you just dis describe your work in race equity um, in the criminal justice system? And Lauren, if you wanna go first, and we'll come down the line. Sure, first let me just say, you know, how wonderful it is to be able to be out here in Wake Forest, but also to live in a community that, you know, we have the county government hosting an event about um, bringing fairness and equity to the criminal justice system. I, I really just sitting here, you just have to stop for one minute and think about that. Folks, this is not happening in every community across this country. It needs to be. Uh, and so I'm very proud of the fact that I live here in Sorg Lake County. I'm grateful. I have really worked to try to find ways that we can increase fairness within the criminal justice system. And a big part of that has been about trying to redefine how we think about public safety. And one of the ways that we need to be thinking about public safety is, you know, how do we allow people to come out of the criminal justice system um, in a way that allows them to be stable in their community and to continue to live productive lives. And so, you know, there are all kinds of programs. I hope that we get an opportunity to talk a little bit tonight about some of the specific initiatives um, that we've undertaken in the last, you know, eight years since I've been DA. There's a lot of work to be done, and I don't think anybody in law enforcement who is in this room or in this community um, would deny that we know that there's a lot of work to be done when it comes to restoring trust and building trust of our community with law enforcement, with the criminal justice system. Um, but every day, you know, we are trying down at the Justice Center there uh, on Salisbury Street in Raleigh to really strike that right balance between keeping our community safe um, and also making sure that we are giving people the opportunity to go on about their lives in a successful way. Awesome. So I am Ashley Gaddy, but I am here representing Dennis Gaddy, the Dennis Gaddy. And you, if you know Dennis, uh, he has done a lot of great work. And so I'm going to kind of just tell you a little bit about him. I have some notes that he left with me. So you have a little bit of me, a little bit of him. So imagine that he's here. Uh, but my father is the executive director, the founding executive director of Community Success Initiative. Um, which does reentry work for people coming home from prison or jail who have found themselves entangled in the criminal justice system. And it's really about the ways in which we can not only provide them with resources, but on the other side of Community Sets Initiative is also lobbying, legislation, really looking into the policies that allow people 
that have made people found themselves there in the first place. Like, why are you there in the first place? And that's a lot of work that Community Success Initiative does, and my father is the executive director of that, also serves as the founding director of Second Chance Alliance, and so um, you may be familiar with Second Chance Alliance and also does criminal justice work and social justice work with North Carolina NAACP. And the ways in which race equity um, work he does and race equity work, and I also do race equity work, is understanding the depths of racial disparities in the criminal justice system. If we talk about the history of this country, crim the criminal justice system is one of the few areas where racial disparities are entrenched and embedded since its inception. And so it is, takes a lot of unpacking and a lot of work that is happening. And those racial perceptions, right, impact policy development on how black and brown people are regulated, how they are controlled. Once uh, a perception or a stereotype or a policy or an image has deemed somebody a criminal, they take that and run with it, right? and policy development has happened, and there has been an excessive amount of black and brown folks in mass incarceration, oftentimes based on racial disparities or racial perceptions or the way that they have been named, right? I thought you were a criminal, so I treated you as such, right? And so that's a lot of the ways in which race really does um, work in the criminal justice system. And the last thing is we have had growing evidence and data that it's, that it's so excessive that it's damaging our communities and neighborhoods, right? Families are being damaged off of excessive mass incarceration. Communities, neighborhoods are being damaged for black and brown people because of the excessive amount of mass incarceration that has a lot of racial disparities. So there's definitely layers to this. Happy to unpack them tonight, um, go over the, the policies that we talked about, but that's just a little bit about who my father is and the ways in which race equity works, really works with uh, criminal justice. Um, in my current role in Wake County, uh, serving as a director of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusivity, I feel as if my work really helps build the foundation of us having conversations like this. Um, being able to normalize the conversation, talking about race, having us have honest conversations about what we've all adopted and what we've all inherited, the systems and the infrastructures that we have, um, to, to build our fluency around having and being able to name what the challenges are. Um, it's interesting because while in this role, being able to have a conversation on this family systemic racism, first of all, like Warren said, this is not normal in communities. This is now becoming more prevalent and more normal, but it's been really tough talking about race because one, we don't practice it. Um, and then two, we've been in fear of my generation, I'm generation, uh, what am I, ex? Am I ex? Okay. I, I felt baby boomerish for a second there when I, when I forgot it. I felt, I felt baby boomerish. But I, 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 in my generation, we were taught to be colorblind. Uh, and that notion of not seeing color really was hinged on us not using race as a determining factor. Uh, but, but ultimately what it did, it scared us away from talking about it. Uh, understanding the complex trauma and experiences, emotionality all connected to race. Um, and so I'm really excited to be in this space to be able to help us all uh, become, uh, to practice, to normalize it, and to be honest about what we have all inherited. I cut my teeth, however, um, and Billy sort of uh, alluded to it, uh, talking about the school to prison pipeline, uh, talking about the overrepresentation of black and brown students that we had being suspended, which increased the likelihood of them being uh, um, having some type of engagement in the juvenile justice system, which then increased the likelihood of what? Of them being engaged in adult corrections. And so the conversations that we were having um, um, when I started my career, talking about the balance between prevention and suppression, and do we have an overrepresentation of suppression, or where are we saving? Where is there more of a cost savings, which is around prevention? So where can we do our most? Where can we actually have the most impact on the trajectory of young people that are out of school between three and six, which increases juvenile, juvenile delinquency opportunities, which then increases the pathway into corrections. And so um, I'm excited to be, a, to be a part of this, even though I know it was completely by accident that Reverend White didn't show up. 
Uh, bless him. I hope I hope all is well. But I'm gonna. I guess you can't cuss out a reverend. But I'm gonna. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna talk to him sternly. <laughs> sternly. Uh, but I, but I, I am excited to be able to even go back into the house of my mind and thinking about um, how this is important from the juvenile justice perspective as well. So. Thank y'all. Um, and so uh, the first real question that we've got is. Uh, You've looked at the blueprint that Wake County has put together. Can you each highlight one of the recommendations or one of the goals that really kind of stood out in the blueprint, um, especially on the criminal justice side that you want to highlight tonight and, and just tell us a little bit about why that one sticks out in your mind? Lauren, you want to go first or you want to switch it up? <laughs> um, yeah, so I actually had the honor of serving at the, with the education equity group. And so a lot of my work happens around education, as you all heard in my bio. But, but for my father and kind of me, the, the focus that we're channeling on is identifying and addressing the ways in which poverty or lack of income really does create a unique experience that then affects people unintendedly, unfairly, there are consequences, collateral consequences to the ways in which people who are economically disadvantaged and black and brown are being seen and treated in the criminal justice system. And what this goal does is it works to eliminate the role of criminal justice fines, the fees that then cycle people into poverty, right? Well, if I'm already having an issue with income, and then there's now a fine or a fee that I have to pay, I already barely have the money to keep my household sustained. I now have to worry about find another way to cover these fees and these fines, right? So now I'm kind of two, I'm already two steps back. Now I'm four steps back because I'm thinking about money all the time in every aspect of my life, right? And the other thing that this goal tries to do, it also says, how can we help with transportation for people, black and brown folks, people who are economically disadvantaged? I have a court date I can't make. Well, for various reasons, I don't have transportation to get there. Okay, well, if I miss it, then what? I get a fine. Now I need the money to find the fine. You see the cycle that happens when we talk about poverty, lack of income, being economically disadvantaged. So what this goal does is says, how can we eliminate the areas that prevent this cycle, this swirl? You feel like you can never get out because there's always something else, right? And you may have felt that feeling in any aspect of life. You just feel like you can't reach the top. And that's what this goal does. It tries to eliminate ways and make it just a little easier to make it to the top on top of kind of the ways in which the criminal justice system. And just very quickly, there is also a goal I'll talk very briefly about are the ways in which we address this over-representation of black and brown people as criminal. This over-representation that it's only black and brown folks or it's largely or mostly black and brown folks who were constantly seen as bad or constantly seen as criminal or constantly seen tied to criminal justice. And so, when we, if that's all we see, that's all we internalize, and that's all we act upon. So there's so, there's so many things here, and my guess is, you know, we could probably spend hours, um, days talking about any number of these, and so it's hard really to, to talk about just one of them. There are nine, and, and I hope y'all have access to this. Um, I want to piggyback, though, on something that Dr. Daddy said, which is this concept of collateral consequences. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going to spend my whole time focusing on that, but it really is very important. And those of us in the criminal justice system, we think about, you know, when somebody gets in trouble, right, they come into court, um, if they are found guilty, they're held accountable and they get a sentence. And whatever that sentence is, is what the judge says they have to do. And then beyond that, there are all these additional things that those of us who work in the criminal justice system come to understand as collateral consequences. And those can be fines that are associated with that sentence, um, you know, but they can also be things down the road like the inability to get a job, um, the inability to keep housing, 
And so really being aware of what those collateral consequences are and how they impact people and how that perpetuates a cycle is so very important. It's one of the reasons why we've spent so much work really trying to focus on are there ways um, to try to make sure that we're holding people accountable. Look, I'm your district attorney and at the end of the day, if somebody breaks a law, part of my responsibility is to hold those folks accountable. But are there ways to do that that allow them um, to you know, get back on their feet? Can we give them a deferral? Can we allow them to do community service in lieu of that conviction? Can we do work around expungement issues and try and get people's records cleaned up? And I've done a lot of work with um, Dr. Gaddy's father, Dennis Gaddy, uh, on that. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that we need to continue to think about, you know, if, when people end up in the system, how do they exit the system in a way that prevents them from coming back and it stabilizes them in the community? But we also need to really think about, you know, how are people ending up in the system and why are people ending up in the system? And to that end, I'm going to focus on two of the initiatives particularly, and one I imagine Danya's going to hit on and she's knows much more about it um, given his background, but really is this idea of, you know, how do we keep children from coming into the criminal justice system? I'm very proud to say that your county commissioners here have funded and are assisting Alliance, which is our behavioral health um, managing company, to stand up a program in our school system that is a diversion program. And so it really is an effort to cut down on those people who are at school, those kids who might do something stupid at school, get in some kind of behavioral type um, you know, problem where uh, maybe they've you know, taken a cell phone from somebody, maybe they've gotten in a fight, and send those kids through a different system other than the criminal justice system, one that you know, pairs services, uh, making sure that they are getting assessed to determine what that underlying mental health need may be or what else they need. Um, that make them succeed in school. And in 21-22, we received 105 referrals of 14 to 18 year olds in the school system that were able to go through that program. Um, 76 of them were actually accepted into the program and 52 of them were able to, you know, complete that program successfully and that kept them out of the criminal justice system. And your county commissioners right now have um, under consideration some additional support to that program so that we can expand it further. But those are the sorts of things and that's just one example I could talk about teen court that we stood up here, you know, almost 30 years ago when I was an assistant DA. But those are the kinds of things that we need to as a community be thinking about and supporting to try to keep children from ever coming into the criminal justice system to begin with. And then the other goal that I want to just kind of point out real fast, because I think that these are examples of places where the community really can get involved, um, is you know, where are those instances where we can divert people away from the criminal justice system for mental health reasons or for behavioral health reasons. And, you know, Raleigh Police Department has set up um, one of the things that we, when we were on the committee looking at uh, initiatives under the blueprint, um, is, you know, how do we set up services within the community that when people are in crisis, instead of taking them to the jail, instead of, you know, taking them into the criminal justice system, are there better ways to serve those people and better ways to handle those situations? And so there are a number of different examples of that that we have going on in Wake County, but certainly Raleigh Police Department and their ACORNS unit, which is, you know, social work, um, people partnering with law enforcement, uh, to try to assess situations when law enforcement's called to the scene uh, and send those people, you know, to either Holly Hill or to UNC Rex or to South Light for substance use disorder treatment. And so I think those are two areas, you know, looking at not only how do we allow people to exit the criminal justice system so they don't come back, but how do we prevent them from going there in the first place? And, and what are appropriate ways to hold people accountable, but to do so in a way that really does, you know, put them in the best position to be stable? Because look, at the end of the day, them not coming back, right? Them not coming back into the court system, them not having interactions with law enforcement again, that is better for not only them, but for all of us. That is part of what is public safety. I love that. I love all of that. Um, it's interesting, I was just reflecting on, um, back in 1988, there was this um, Stop the Violence movement um, that was led by KRS-One, this hip hop act out of, uh, 
out of the Bronx. Uh, if you, some of you all may or may not remember, you know, um, self-destruction, you headed for self-destruction. Come on, y'all, am I that old? I, don't, I didn't see a few people behind nodding their heads. But, but I remember in that song, um, you know, it was talking about, uh, in the hip hop community, it came together to ultimately say, we have to be, um, um, we need to solve the problem on our, on our end within the black and brown communities. And it was about empowerment to solve the problem. And it says that we acknowledge that there's some dysfunctional systems, but we need to be accountable to stopping the violence. But I remember in the video, there was this interesting tagline um, that, that came across the bottom. And it, one, it gave a statistic about the number of black and brown adults that were being arrested. But the one that really stuck out to me, I was getting my hair cut, and I remember this, I was getting a flat top, it was nice, it was so dope. And, and come on now. <laughs> but the stat that really stood out to me was, and I can't remember it, I was just trying to figure out if I could find it while I was um, waiting for my turn to go. But I remember the statistic talking about the cost of incarceration. And, and, and it was the cost, and, if I, and I, mean, I could be wrong, but I feel as if the statistic that was put up across that wonderful video that was telling, telling us to stop the violence said that the, exp the annual expenses of inc adult incarceration was around $22 million. Now, again, that was 1988. Um, I asked Billy a second ago when we were just sitting over here getting ready, and I said, what's the cost of one uh, uh, housing one adult in corrections and for one year and he said $45,000 and we have about 30,000 incarcerated adults and the cost for housing a juvenile um, is a, a little over 100,000 120,000 and we have what 300 to about two three hundred young people and so the recommendation that really resonates with me is the reallocation of resources to looking at, because suppression is important, especially for folks don't do, but we get the more bang for our buck if it goes to, and we work towards issues and initiatives that focus in on prevention and intervention. And we all know, uh, and I love Warren, you bringing up sort of the, uh, the opportunities to prevent young people, preventing adults from getting even engaged or involved. One thing that I will advocate for, and this is what, and please understand that this group right here is just a small percentage of folks that were part of a larger work group that came up with these recommendations. So we're just honored to just kind of give a little bit about what everybody was talking about, the 20 or so odd people that were a part of this work group that led up these recommendations. But I really want to advocate for us looking at how do we redistribute uh, resources to focus on early prevention strategies such as mentoring. Um, such as after school programs, out of school programs, looking at different alternatives for young people that may be engaging in delinquent behaviors, not getting into the system, but a diversion program. How much, how much, how much does a, ment uh, a mentoring program cost a volunteer in comparison to 45,000 a year for one adult? I think that makes good, good sense, right? And, and, and to me, at least from my perspective, we need to re, not only reinvest because there are some really great programs that are out there, uh, but there needs to be this honest conversation about how do we move, I think, really kind of change and shift the paradigm of punishment um, to me not being as punitive as it has been in the past, but how can we deal with it within a community, maybe a community-based alternative. But I'll get off my, 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 my soapbox here for a second. Thank you. So um, just think, from the state perspective, where I come from, um, I've worked with the track recommendations, which are the racial equity task force that the governor and um, the Supreme Court put together and to look at this particular issue. And many of the things that are in your blueprint pro, uh, uh, that you guys have put together are also in those track recommendations that the governor has put together. But this one to highlight too, that um, you guys kind of hit on, but also um, build on them a little bit. What Danya was just saying, we just did uh, results first, Pew, the Pew Institute went and did a study and looked at our community-based alternatives that we do have in the state of North Carolina. And we do have rich community-based alternatives in our state through our juvenile crime prevention councils, which are county commissioners help fund and state helps fund. 
Um, these juvenile crime prevention councils last year served almost 25,000 kids across the state and 600 nonprofit programs across the state that help keep those kids out of uh, juvenile confinement that does cost $120,000. Uh, $120,000, $1,000 a year. Imagine what you could do in your local community with those dollars. I mean, what kind of resources could you wrap around a child for $120,000 a year? Um, I think a whole lot, right? Now, um, it, it, and the reality is that the kids that do get confined, um, what uh, Lauren was talking about a few minutes ago about having diversions for mental health uh, problems. 100% of the kids that were confined last year in a, a youth development center, 100% of them had a mental health diagnosis, 100%. Over 50% of them had five or more mental health diagnoses. So the question is, what do we miss? And where do we miss it? Um, I always tell people, if we're waiting until kids get to the criminal justice system to work on disparities in the system, we've waited too long. So I just want to emphasize what Danya was just talking about with those alternatives and, and really hit on that because I think it's an important point. One of the other things that I saw in the blueprint, um, and it's very similar to stuff that we were looking at with uh, the, the state level one, is school resource officers. How do we work with school resource officers? These are the police officers and sheriff's deputies that work in our schools. We know that the public, we did a survey in Wake County, right? And we asked folks, do you want law enforcement in your schools? Overwhelmingly, most people said yes, right? Why is that? Because our society is a little crazy right now, right? Um, it, when, when people are scared to go to the grocery store or scared to go to school or scared to be out in their community um, because of mass shootings that occur, um, we've got a problem, right? And so I think the solution there on the school resource officers is we do better training. Because what we have found is that if you train a school resource officer well, then they're actually more likely to divert a child than to confine a child. Um, but we've got to train them. We've got to help them understand it. Because here's the options, folks. The other option is that we have, we call 911 when we have a problem at a school. And then an officer that's coming off the street, that's off the beat, is coming into your school that has no idea how juvenile justice works, all right? And you can ask the Chief, Chief Armstrong over here, or folks from Wake Forest of PD, they can tell you that most law enforcement doesn't want to deal with, with juveniles because they're tough. It's a whole different set of laws, right? Um, and they just don't want to deal with it. Having a school resource officer that is trained and understands how to work with kids can make a huge difference. And so what we need to do is up our training and make sure that we're putting professionals in those schools that want to be there, that have a heart for kids. Um, because that can make all the difference in the end when they're making a decision about is this a kid I'm going to send a referral to or is this a kid that I'm going to call um, the Haven House down the street to go and, and, and take that child or is this a kid I'm going to refer to teen court. And so I, I think as, we, as, as I know the blueprint is a living and breathing document, we really need to think about that as, as we move forward about how do we better train those officers to do that job in our schools moving forward. And I, I do want to highlight one last thing that Lauren said because it's an excellent point. That program that they're doing with Alliance is awesome. It diverts a lot of kids from the system. Teen Court diverts a lot of kids from the system. They also have restorative justice circles in Wake County. What a unique opportunity. Campbell University came in and taught youth interns in their law school to teach restorative justice um, to, to school counselors so they could do restorative justice programs for kids. Those are all things that we need to look at because prevention does pay. What that results first survey that we did with the Pew Institute showed us is for every dollar that you spend on prevention, you save $7,552. For every dollar you put in $7,552. Now, if I told you you could put $1 in today and buy a stock and you're gonna get $7,552 in a month from now, I think everybody in this room would invest in that. So we as a society need to say we're going to start investing in those programs because that's what's going to pay off in the end for our young folks. All right, I'm going to get off my soapbox because I'm supposed to be the moderator. And the church said. <laughs> so we know to change this, we've got to involve some stakeholders. Um, so who are the stakeholders that you all believe need to be part of this uh, the conversation to work on race equity um, in, in Wake County? Can we go first, Dr. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, I think, and I'm not going to 
say them all because I want to save you all some stakeholders to consider. Um, but I, I will say, and I, and I was, and I thought I saw a couple of young folk here, um, but I would say let's start with some young folk. Start with some some students. Let's engage um, our our. Is it what? It's not millennial anymore. It's Gen Z. Gen, Z. Gen Alpha. Gen Alpha. Gen Alpha. There you go. So not that old. Yeah, Gen Alpha. We need some Gen Alphas in the room. We need some Gen Zs in the room to have honest conversations about. Uh, and it's interesting doing uh, formally doing work around gang prevention. We had to have conversations around the why. You know, why do young people see gangs as a viable way of success? And some of the things that we found out by just asking young people why, the number one reason, and this is a statewide uh, analysis of the conversation of why young people join gangs. You want to know the number one reason? Anybody? Community? So, Actually, community and engaged in social connections was number two. The number one reason? Boredom. Boredom. Kids from Charlotte said that. Kids from Tyrell County said the same exact thing. Boredom. Um, now, that aha moment that you all just had, that's what we need to have with young people talking about the issue of criminal justice reform and reimagining because we need to have their fresh perspective and how they view things because they're gonna be the ones carrying the torch uh, moving forward. So that's a key stakeholder that we oftentimes neglect. I really want to engage the business community and that's one of the reasons why I was so particularly impressed with this effort by the Raleigh Chamber um, who really was along with the county and the city of Raleigh and a number of other stakeholders but really did lead the charge on this blueprint because you know, the reality is and Dr. Gaddy has um, touched upon it already but you know economic opportunity and economic inequality in the way that they play out uh, in the criminal justice system um, really does compound what might already be some existing problems with the criminal justice system and so you know really engaging business leaders um, specifically to make sure that they are taking opportunity to look at and to hire people who may be exiting the criminal justice system I think is a really important thing another thing we're spending a lot of time right now um, focusing on is court appearance rates and people coming to court and you know without getting too far down that rabbit hole I can tell you that when people fail to come to court it is a whole snowball of you know consequences that happen and when you look at one of the reasons why people fail to come to court is because they are hourly employees and they are concerned about losing their job because they're missing out if they come to court. We don't get to dispose of a case in a single session. And so sometimes it takes people coming back over and over and over again. And so I, and yeah, there's just lots of ways that educating business community and having them involved in helping solve some of these issues, I think would make a real difference. Yeah, there are a few stakeholders that come to mind. <clears throat> Excuse me, one, eligible voters, right? Um, especially voters who have been formally impacted. Um, understanding that there is a real desire for change there. Um, also, of course, local state governments, um, along with businesses, anyone who has decision-making power. The, the work that I do in consulting and training, guidance and advisory really works with the people who have the power to then make the change. A lot of times we're, 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 we need the people who are being impacted, but they're already being impacted, right? You want me to be in charge of my change too? Like I'm tired, right? So we need people with power, we need people with resources to be able to be educated, to be able to learn because they are key stakeholders, especially if they have decision-making uh, power or resources. And then allow for that training that Bill was talking about, allow that to be from formerly incarcerated people, right? How do we get people who have been entangled in the criminal justice system, and emphasis on the people, right? All language matters. How people who have been formerly incarcerated, put the person first, person first language, how do we get them in front of these audiences? How do we get them in front of the businesses and in front of the local communities and the government communities to, to tell their story and to do the training side by side with the facilitator, right? Like the doctorate is cool, but at the end of the day, give me someone who lived it any day, right? 
And so how can we co-facilitate with people who have lived, who have been impacted? And so, so eligible voters, people who have decision-making power, and one of the stakeholders I feel are formerly incarcerated people to get them in front of audiences talking and training people and corporations. I think the answer uh, unanimously here was everybody. <laughs> Um, so thank y'all for that. Uh, so the last prepared question that we have, and then we'll open it up to the, the floor for a couple of questions if we have to see how much time we got. Um, so the last question I have, though, is um, what is the one takeaway that you would want people to take away from today's meeting to take back into their local community and start working? Um, and I, whoever wants to take it first. So along with the policy, uh, or along with the goal that we talked about with this overrepresentation of black and brown people tied to this word criminal, or criminalization of black and brown bodies is kind of another way to say it. One thing I really want you all to take away is really stop and reflect and be mindful of how you're engaging with these political slogans that really kind of indirectly point to black and brown people, right? Meaning, when don't play so much into this black on black crime, black people, black people ain't killing black people because they're black. I can guarantee you that, right? How are you? How are you playing into this idea of the welfare queen? You all remember that in the Reagan era, this black woman who's taking from the government and on welfare for her needs. How do you? When you think about the war on crime and you think about how drugs and and crime is really the, you know putting the hammer down. Who are you talking about? Because most time, more times than not, political slogans, political campaigns around crime, around drugs, is usually emphasizing a certain group, right? There is usually black and brown people who is being talked about. So really reflect and say, when I talk, when I'm using my language, even if I don't directly say I'm talking about a black kid or a brown kid, what am I playing into that could say, you didn't even have to say it, I know what you mean. I know who you're talking about. Everybody knows that the war on drugs and the crack pandemic and the crack epidemic was about a certain group of folks. Well, nobody criminalizing opioids and, uh, you know, and pills the same way that we were talking about crack. So who are you talking about? <laughs> who are you indirectly, you didn't even have to say it because we know who you mean. I really want us to reflect on how we are using our language around crime because it perpetuates this over-representation of who somebody looks like and what they're tied to. And like I said before, when that message is constantly perpetuated, it's so embedded in your practices that you didn't even mean to be biased towards that person, but all of a sudden you snap, you held your purse a little closer and don't even know why. Because they've been seen as a thug or they've been seen as a criminal or they've been seen as, and you could be black and brown yourself still holding your purse. But now I'll pass the mic. Well, why are you looking at me so <laughs> um, I had I had something eloquent, but I got lost in your voice. Listen. I don't even want to go the direction I was going. You inspired me to go another direction. If you for those that was listening to Dr. Gaddy, and there was that little bit of um that uh, uncomfortable feeling, if there was a little bit of that, uh, she maybe making me stretch a bit, um, or maybe um, um, pushing against maybe a belief system that I, how or how I was socialized, resist that urge to run away. Resist the urge, because that's where we're going to have the opportunity to evolve as as as, as a community. That, to me. The biggest challenge that we have in this work to advance towards race equity and to have honest conversations about um, systems. And again, I will always say the systems that we have all inherited is that there's this thing called an empathy gap. 
and a way to learn, uh, to understand uh, everyone's lived experiences, to be able to effectively deal with a challenge or a problem, we have to reduce that empathy gap. And you cannot run away from those experiences. You have to lean into them. And trust me, we believe this to be true, that well-intentioned people create inequities every single day, okay? So this panel, this blueprint, this conversation isn't about pointing at any one of us. But what we wanna do is be mindful about the influence and the role of using our power and our privilege to advance the conversation, to be bold in it, and to know that right now, just let's just go ahead and acknowledge that there's this backlash uh, that will be persistent around having the conversation that we're having today. And typically, it comes in three, one of three big buckets. Uh, the first, I call it the three Ds. The first one is distancing yourself from the problem. Well, I've never seen the inequities with my black and brown friends. I have a black friend right now. And he's never experienced that, so they can't be a problem. That's distancing. Then the denial part is, well, my grandfather or my great-great-grandfather came to this country uh, with nothing. And they were able to do what? Pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And then the last one, which is something that I think is more venomous, um, it's a little bit more corrosive, and that's the distortion of the problem. Having conversation about race equity is not about replacing anybody. It is no theory around white replacement. There's no theory about pushing people out of the room. The question is, how do we invite people to the table to be a part of the conversation? And so we have to actively resist, whether it's ourselves as individuals or those who are around us, to making sure that we make sure that this becomes a normalized conversation, that it's okay to talk about these tough things that that's the only way we're gonna move forward. So thank you for the inspiration. We need to take interest in our kids um, and we need to invest in our kids. Um, and we've, we've got to do that by not necessarily saying the same thing that we've always said as when people get older, they always say the kids today, right? These kids today, right? Um, and we may think it in our head, um, but we need to get to the point where we're actually saying, what role do I have to play? What else do you, what else can I do to, to help this situation? Um, beyond my busy schedule as, as being the Deputy Secretary of, of Juvenile Justice, also in the Scoutmaster. You know, I'm trying to involve kids and, and, and interact with kids, take them away from that boredom, right? Um, we, we've got to say to ourselves, how else can I be part of the solution? And the other thing that I see is, We've got to re-engage kids to be to, to, to be public servants again. Um, I mean, the, the the reality is that state government is having trouble hiring people. Law enforcement's having trouble with hiring people. Um, DAs are having trouble hiring people. It's because we've been bad mouth in public service for so long in this country, and that's where a lot of um, black and brown people can get some fairness. Um, is if we make sure they're included in those roles in public service. Um, and we need to make sure that they feel like they, they can be part of that conversation. Um, and, and we can build those relationships back. And so um, those are just my, my two cents on it. I think we got time for maybe one question, one question. So who's gonna be the brave one that gets the one question? Do you wanna go, uh, I, I guess the chair, the county commission should, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm me. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I just want to go back to something that you said um, before I asked my question. Just talking about school resource officers and school resource officer training. Um, so I went to the best high school in Cumberland County, which was E. Smith, and my school resource officer, don't stop, sir. Um, my school resource officer was um, Hubert Peterkin. Hubert Peterkin ended up being the sheriff in Hope County. Um, and one of the things that we found, and my husband is on the other side of the room, we went to high school together and we talk often about Sheriff Peterkin because when he was our school resource officer, he knew our school community. He knew the students there. He knew the families that went to E.E. E. Smith. And so when there was a situation to be diffused, he had insight about that family. He knew that somebody was hungry. He knew that somebody had an issue at home or he knew 
what was happening. And so when we talk about school resource officer training, I think that the point you made about people coming off the beat into a school and having to diffuse the situation, to me, it really is about relationships. And oftentimes, I feel like as a community, we get so far away from what relationships can do and be for us that it makes it difficult to think about things from another perspective. So my question really is when we think about dismantling some of the issues in our criminal justice system, some of the things that our children are facing, ways that we can challenge the preschool to prison pipeline, what role can relationships play in that? Great question. <clears throat> So I'll just jump in really fast. One of the areas that I've done some work on, and a lot of y'all know about this, I'm sure, is adverse childhood experiences. And again, you know, our county is taking a leadership role in trying to raise awareness about adverse childhood experiences. Um, you know, we know that when children grow up in violent homes, they are more likely to perpetuate violence. We know when children grow up around gunfire in a neighborhood, they are more likely to end up being engaged in that kind of behavior, and violence perpetuates violence. You know, the studies around adverse childhood experiences really do show um, that the number one thing that can assist a child in kind of transcending those, those experiences is a positive reinforcing relationship, healthy relationship with an adult person. And so there's so many ways, I mean, whether it's through leading a you know, youth group at church, leading a scouts club, getting involved in big brothers, big sisters, there's so many ways that we can build those relationships with individuals, with children who may be experiencing trauma that really does change, I mean, the, the research proves changes the trajectory of their lives. Yeah, and I'll just add that part of the relationship is meeting, is understanding that generation. So the way in which, so some of y'all might have to get a little hip to TikTok, okay? Some of y'all might have to download an app or two to see what they're looking at, to see what they're doing, or hire a millennial, right? Or hire someone Gen Z who can say, what is my entry point to that generation, to that youth? If you're so disconnected, you can be so positive, but they still gonna be like, you don't know nothing about me. You know what I'm saying? You don't get it. Even though it took me a cycle of generation that I'm like, oh my gosh, our parents actually did get it, right? They actually do get it. I actually get it now when I look at my kids. But from their vantage point, they think that you don't. So what are the ways that we say, let me meet you where you are, that starts the relationship to even, for them to even see the positivity to say, okay, well, let's do a TikTok dance together, or are you into creating reels, or are you into sports, or what is it that you're into? And we may be oblivious to the technology, we may be oblivious to the way in which they're doing it, but be willing to at least try or be willing to get someone alongside you who may have a better understanding. Because I think that if they believe that you understand, if they believe that you're cool, if they believe that you know a little bit about what they're dealing with or about their world, they'll lock in. And when they lock in and then see that you're positive, I have students from my very first year of teaching that they're like, I'm still in your phone because they locked in. And I think that that's what we have to be willing to do, even if we're like, you know, this generation, get on that level. That's a song too, get on that level. What? Get on that level and enter that way. Listen, I, I, gotta, I gotta read this quote because it really speaks to what Dr. Gaddy just said. Um, and you all tell me who, who actually said this quote. Uh, children, they have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders and love chatter in a place of exercise. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents and they tyrannize their teachers. Children are now tyrants. That's deep. Children are now tyrants. Guess who said it? Socrates. Every generation looks at the younger generation and says, those kids don't know nothing. Those kids are crazy. Those kids, that's exactly, I mean, this is not new, is my point. 
Um, and so reaching in and making sure that we connect. I mean, if it ain't on MySpace, I'm not on it, but I mean, TikTok for sure. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm definitely for sure. Thank you, thank you. It's, it's a great question, and um, we did a, a survey in Wake County, it's been, it's been probably four or five years ago now, um, that asked kids about protective factors. And one of the biggest protective factors that kids can have, you can have risk factors, and what protects you against those risk factors is having protective factors. One of the biggest risk uh, protective factors you can have is having positive adult role models or mentors or relationships. All right, only one in, uh, one in five kids, 20% of the kids in Wake County said they had five or more positive adult role models in their life. Only 20% of kids. Folks, if you want to talk about how we can change this dynamic, we got to build relationships. We got to get involved with kids. And that's, uh, that, that's just crazy. Think about when you were a kid. All right? You had the teacher, um, you had the preacher, you had the, the, the club leader that you were part of, you had your coach. Um, you had the law enforcement officer that was that, that person, like an E.E. E. Smith, right? You know, you had those relationships. And today, and COVID did a lot for this, right? Tore down a lot of those relationships that we have with young people, and we've got to build them back. If we truly want to make a difference and get, uh, get, get involved in, in creating those protective factors for kids, then we've got to rebuild those relationships and get that 20% up to 100%. Um, because uh, we got a long ways to go in, in that regard. Um, no more time. We're done? All right. So let's uh, give the, the panel a, a huge round of applause. I, I didn't expect to hear so many music lyrics coming out of them, but uh, we appreciate that too. Thank y'all so much. Do you guys know how to access this online? How do we access this online? Yes, you can go to abetterwake.com slash blueprint. So let's give another round of applause for our amazing moderator and panelists. So really quick, one um, last thing that I would love for us to do. Um, first, I wanna say the therapist in me says that we can't fix what we won't face. So I have to commend each of you for being here tonight to at least acknowledge that we have some work to do. The other thing we heard from the panelists was that there, everyone in the room plays a role in moving this work forward. So how many of you raised your hand when I said you are somebody? So I wanna give, provide an opportunity for you all to um, acknowledge your role in this work and we're gonna do a quick group activity so that you can give us your feedback, your um, understanding of the work that needs to happen in your community. And um, this is our fourth town hall. And we've heard so much wonderful information from across Wake County about how we can move this work forward in each community because it looks different in each community. And so we're here tonight to talk about criminal justice and we have three questions that we wanna ask you. We're gonna come around the room and give you a big sticky note. And we want you to answer these three questions in about five minutes. <laughs> But this is just the beginning because we want your feedback in order to move to the next step so that you all will see the implementation of the work that we've started tonight. So give us about two seconds. We're gonna give you the paper. We want you to answer these three questions and then we will close. We have what we call blueprint action committees. These are folks like yourselves who are passionate about the work who are passionate about what you heard today. And we want you all to use this QR code and we want you all to join an action committee. You can join for criminal justice. We have four action committees for each of our sectors. That's education equity, that is economic mobility, that is health equity, and that is criminal justice. You can join all four, you can join one, you can join whichever you would like, but join an action committee. Continue the conversation. And at our next town halls, we'll be hearing from y'all. What have y'all been talking about, right? Because we want this to continue to be a community-led effort. All right? Make sure you join an action committee. If you have any questions, the panelists are up here. But other than that, you all go in peace. Have a wonderful evening and have a wonderful week, everybody. Thank y'all for joining us. <laughs>